How do we get started on the gargantuan undertaking of creating a Dyson Swan to bootstrap our intergalactic expansion? Why do this? Welcome to Science, Technology and the Future. We are here with Stuart Armstrong and we'll discuss how very easy it might be to get a Dyson Swan going. And once we have one, the surprisingly short time and small amount of resources it might take to get our intergalactic colonisation efforts underway. And wow! Forget disassembling Mercury, we might need only a few medium to large sized asteroids worth of material to do this. Stuart is a researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute, Oxford. He is the author of the book Smarter Than Us about superintelligence and why we might want to make it friendly. He also co-authored a fascinating paper with Anders Sandberg titled Eternity in Six Hours, The Intergalactic Spreading of Intelligent Life and Sharpening the Fermi Paradox which in a nutshell suggests that intergalactic colonisation of an appreciable portion of the visible universe seems possible given the resources in our solar system alone, that it shouldn't be that much more difficult to achieve than mere interstellar colonisation, interstellar meaning just our galaxy. The seeming ease of colonisation efforts makes the Fermi paradox sharper, that is, um, more poignant, if we consider that early civilizations would have done this. And in this light, some standard resolutions to the Fermi paradox need revision. Note, I did an interview with Anders Sandberg and George Savorsky, as well as Robin Hansen recently, on galactic megastructures and colonisation. And with Stuart Armstrong did some interviews on AI safety around 2012, during the time of the Winter Intelligence Conference in Oxford. And there's been a number of other interviews with Stuart since then, so check those out as well. But now, Strap yourselves into your Futurology appreciation chairs and join us for a wild ride into the possibly near-term future of exploratory engineering, superintelligence, cosmic megastructures, self-replicating von Neumann probes, and game-theoretical views on intergalactic expansion. And remember, it's never too early to start planning. Stuart, welcome back. Thank you. Now, um, you and Anders Sandberg have uh, written a paper called Eternity in Six Hours, Intergalactic Spreading of Intelligent Life and Sharpening the Fermi Paradox. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it important to think about these subjects? Well, what... There's to dive lot. right in. Uh, well, first of all, because it's fascinating. You're talking about life, um, uh, life itself where it comes from, where it might be, how you might interact and uh, stirring the imagination and all the usual arguments. But there's actually a practical uh, reason here because one of the potential explanations for the Fermi paradox is that civilizations always destroy themselves before they become star spanning. Uh, if this is the case, then it's uh, very relevant uh, for us to know that. Um, Robin Hansen framed it in terms of the great filter. There's some great filter that is cutting off um, expansionist civilizations uh, throughout the universe because we just don't see them. Now, is it an early great filter, which means that life just doesn't evolve, or is it a very late one, which means, as I said, life blows itself up or kills itself off in some other reason? If it's the last one, well, we should be a bit worried about it. Well, certainly, yeah. Um, we've covered the the great filter. Um, I actually did an interview with uh, with Robin Hansen on this subject itself, and it certainly is maybe a little bit unintuitive, but it's certainly once you you understand the concepts, it's certainly very frightening uh, that we yeah that we can't really see any evidence of galactic spanning civilizations, um, and the 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 great filter, a large portion of it, could be quite could be just ahead of us. And, and that's particularly scary. Um, yeah, indeed. Um, personally, I don't think there's much chance anymore of the Great Filter being ahead of us. Okay. Why is that? Um, because of all the disasters that could end humanity, there is one that doesn't explain the Fermi paradox, and that is AI. Because if humanity were to fall to an AI for any reason, the mm -hmm. AI would find it even easier to expand across the universe than humans mm. would. Mm. And we can't and, see any evidence of that. And we know it's not just we don't see any evidence of that. It's in a sense, we're not very far from AI. And I use this 
in a very loose sense, not necessarily when we humans could build an AI, but when some sort of intelligent life at about our level could have built an AI if they had a different brain architecture. Basically, I think we're not too far from building off an AI ourselves. And if we had a different brain architecture, we would have already done it under certain circumstances. Uh, this to me suggests that we've, we've got over, if there is a great filter, we're, we're beyond it because we're, we're either on the verge of being, well, uh, of, uh, of being, of expanding throughout the universe, us or our descendants, or we would counterfactually be on the verge of doing it. What do you mean by counterfactually being on the verge of doing it? As I said, so part of the reasons that uh, AI is difficult for us is because our own brains are a very messy architecture and very difficult to read, very difficult to interpret. Right. So, but I do imagine that there would be other possible aliens where it would be a lot easier, a lot clearer, where they could use their own brains a lot more effectively as a basis for um, designing AIs. So what I'm, what I'm basically saying is aliens at our level of development could have developed AI. And if that's the case, then the filter has to be earlier than this level of development. Well, let's talk about actually achieving like a, a galactic scale megastructures and bootstrapping to like Kardashev type two civilizations, which you've discussed before. And then, um, you know, uh, seeding the galaxy and fanning out Merkel Friedis probes to, to sort of populate the, the, the nearby galaxies and perhaps the observable universe. And, and why would we want to do that game theoretically? Um, do, do we assume that the listeners know what Kardashev types are? Or should okay. I explain that? Yes, yes, yes. Let's, let's, let's explain what Kardashev type 1, 2, and 3 civilizations are. And also of note, Kardashev, Nikolai Kardashev died just a few months ago. And so did, and Freeman Dyson also passed away a few days ago. So um, yeah, it's a good time to talk about these sorts of things. So the, the big prophets of future expansion into the universe have passed on, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so Kardashev had the idea of uh, what he defines type one, type two, and type three civilizations, which were mainly classified on the resources or the energy that they could use. The Kardashev type one was one that could use all the energy of a planet. The type two was a solar system. The type three was a galaxy and people have extended it to type four, which is basically the reachable universe. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, let's not get too uh, into the details of exactly what it means. Like, I think that humanity will become a type two civilization without ever really being a type one. But that th these sort of idea that you get, this is the order of magnitude of what you can do yes. is a, a good one. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, um, it seems as though we wouldn't necessarily want to use all the resources on Earth before we started using, like, turning our local sun into a Dyson swarm or something like that. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, so what does this, if, if we can see a plausible um, roadmap to doing so, uh, um, what would that look like? And yeah, after that, we can discuss why we can't see any evidence of other civilizations doing that. Well, it all depends on something that I call sort of recursive manufacturing. It's uh, basically that you use your energy and your resources to build factories and energy captors that gives you more energy and more resources with which you build more and so on. And if that process can be made to work, uh, then it doesn't really matter um, the speed of that process. But if you get the feedback loop, 
the exponential feedback loop, then you get to Kardashev type two in ridiculously short uh, amounts of time. Indeed. Uh, the paper that you talked about, the Eternity in Six Hours paper, um, was uh, we as, uh, talked about the disassembly of Mercury happening in 30 years. Um, but in a way, this was an unduly conservative uh, approach. Oh. Because we assumed that we wouldn't get sort of super materials, or not even super materials, but things beyond what we can do today. Right. If we can use the stronger materials, then something like a large asteroid would be sufficient. Hmm. Yeah. But the whole thing is to get the feedback loop working. So strong automation would be a help uh, in that. Some people might be a little bit sort of uh, skeptical about uh, whether we can do such things. Um, and I think you mentioned, yeah, in, in fact, in your paper, you mentioned exploratory engineering. And I felt that like it was a really interesting concept. Uh, yes. Uh, so the basic, what exploratory engineering tries to do is to imagine what we could do in the future um, based on, first of all, what's impossible in the laws of physics, so we know we can't do that, and modeling what it is plausible that we could do. Uh, one of the big assumptions in that is that if it happens in nature, then we can reproduce it or co-opt it at some point. So, for example, cells, well, they replicate, they build structures. An acorn is basically something that manufactures a huge acorn, a solar-powered acorn factory, um, i.e. a tree. So this sort of, uh, if we make the assumption that this sort of technology is something we will be able to get quite soon because it already exists in some form, this gives a certain level of plausibility to our speculations. And because we already know that, say, an invasive species can invade an ecosystem and sort of cover it all in very, uh, in very rapid uh, or very short amounts of time, uh, I think you have a, um, a, an experience with rabbits uh, down in Australia, do. for example. Rabbits and cane toads. Um, so the sort of idea that from a small beginning you can basically fill the whole thing is uh, that was the recursive manufacturing. That's not implausible um, as long as the resources last. So that's why the, when I talk about disassembling planets or disassembling asteroids, um, I'm not focusing on the immense amount of energy that you would need to do this. And look, so this is a huge scale. It could never happen. Uh, that's sort of like Australia's so big, these pairs of rabbits uh, could never fill it. Um, but more on if we keep the loop going, uh, as long as the resources last, how far can it go? And if we assume it can go far, which under exploratory engineering is not implausible, then yes, you take planets apart, small planets, uh, and uh, asteroids and things like that in very short timelines, like 30 years or less. So yeah, do you want to uh, just do, give a quick rundown of how we uh, might go about first building a Dyson Swarm? Okay. Now, in science fiction, a Dyson sphere is always a rigid a Dyson shell, a sort of super rigid thing, mainly because it looks cool. Now, there is a minor problem with these things. Well, two minor problems. The first is it has no gravitational interaction with the sun inside it, so it'll tend to drift. And when something that heavy drifts, um, it can get very dangerous. The other thing is that the stresses on it would be impossibly huge. Um, and there's no plausible way you could ever build that. So the other design that we're looking at is just basically a Dyson Swarm, which is basically lots and lots of mirrors floating around the sun in various orbits. Um, they don't have to be particularly thick, they just need to be reflecting the sun. And then the mirrors reflect the, sun, the sunlight of the sun down on several central points, and there you have a heat pump or some way of transforming 
this into energy in some uh, efficient way and then you laser it from place to place or you find other ways of transferring it like you might transform it into potential energy and kick out an object and have that as the energy upon arrival anyway there's lots of different ways you can move the energy around at that point but the basic thing is almost tin foil but with struts and things like that lots and lots of it on drifting around the sun um and concentrating down on various heat engines that transform this into energy and then shuttling the energy to where we can use it excellent and um where would we get this matter uh, to bootstrap you you mentioned asteroids before um but would we be sort of disassembling mercury and venus <laughs> so the paper suggests disassembling mercury uh, I am almost certain this is not going to happen. Um, it was more a proof of concept that showed that it could be done, that you could disassemble Mercury in 30 years or so if you got the cycle um, going of building solar captors, getting energy, building factories, building solar captors, and getting energy and so on. But um, what is more likely is, in the calculations there, I was assuming mirrors about a millimeter thick or so, um, which wow. is extremely excessive. Um, because if we get sort of stronger materials, because uh, remember, remember, we can put a lot of struts here. And uh, basically, what we use now is basically struts and tinfoil is kind of the ideal but if we get sort of much stronger materials we can make the average width of it much much smaller and if you can do that then the amount of material you need plunges and you can get it done as i said with a large asteroid um, i'd be ashamed to see uh, ceres go but maybe one of the other ones mm. and the other th advantage with an asteroid is that you can start it small we can start putting out some and then we can put up more as need be. Um, and if we eventually start mining Mercury, we could start mining Mercury with the energy from the asteroid built. Um, and, uh, the, the, and the other reason I'm emphasizing that this is a lot of mirrors is that this means that we don't need to worry too much about the materials that it's made out of. The actual bit that transforms sunlight into energy is a very small portion of this. All that we need is the ability to reflect for most of the matter. And you can do that with a lot of different types of matter. Hmm. So we might have some sort of solar collector on Earth or on Mercury um, or Venus or something like that. So it's some place where we can um, actually capture that energy and beam it anywhere we want right yes I, I don't i don't know because the amount of energy involved are so absurdly high um the daily mail actually did a short article on our paper yes uh which was technically accurate uh and they presented it as a solution to the world's energy problems oh, okay and tech technically it is in the same way that a nuclear bomb is a solution to your lack of heat problems. Um, this would generate more than a billion times more energy than we generate today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, so it all depends on how much energy we're going to need, how much energy we're going to reuse. Um, it's, um, so sort of speculating on the fine details of where it's gathered. And especially as I say, with this amount of energy, this is the amount of energy that you can use to shoot things out to the furthest reaches of the galaxy. This means that we can start restructuring our solar system quite extensively. Um, basically, so apart from Jupiter, and maybe Saturn, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think all the other planets are definitely the Earth, the four rocky planets are basically rounding errors 
um, for the energy of the sun. Mm. So if we, at this point, so we could disassemble Mercury to make this, but with this kind of energy taking apart the Earth or Mars or Venus, for whatever reasons, even just aesthetics, um, becomes uh, ridiculous, becomes feasible. Um, now, mm. why, sh why would we do that? I don't know. I have no idea what our descendants will be wanting to do or not wanting to do. Um, it's but also this the you... Oort cloud. And that's yeah. got a lot more mass than the planets, apparently, right? Well, okay. Um, I mean, I don't know. I've always okay. learned that basically the solar system is the sun and Jupiter and some dust. Um, right. So, um... yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, okay. So this is all assuming that we can achieve atomically precise manufacturing. Is that correct? Or some form of nanotechnology? No. Um, if you get to that, then yes, you can do this. But we just, it, it's basically between what our best materials today are and the sort of nanotechnology supermaterials. So nanotechnology supermaterials, we're talking about medium-sized asteroids um, <laughs> or that kind of thing. So as we, as we scale between the two, we need less, hmm. um, less so if we materials. could achieve graphene um, just without atomically precise manufacturing, if we could just use that uh, efficiently, we would need someone like in between a medium to a few large asteroids. Is that correct? I don't have the exact numbers yeah, on yeah. this. It, would, it, would you ensure it? Uh, yeah, I mean, with atomically precise things, we could we could use, we don't we could use asteroids and not necessarily the largest ones. So presumably, um, with uh, graphene, uh, I, I, whose characteristics I don't know. I just know it's strong. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we could it's somewhere in the middle and again remember that this this is to dyson the whole sun mm. all of it um we if we even without getting super materials and without disassembling mercury if we just want to dyson a reasonable um part of the sun then uh to get merely say a million times our current energy budget rather than a billion, then we're, we can do that. And I just want to mention that I love using the verb Dyson in terms of Dysoning the sun. Yes, I like that too. <laughs> well, I mean, this sounds like a grand project. Now, uh, what should we do in order to achieve at least beginning this? Um, is, do we need to solve AI first? Would you say friendliness problem in AI, or, or would can we like do things in parallel? What are your sort of what does the roadmap look like to you? AI is very unpredictable, so of course um, I would say that we need to ensure that AI is safe because um, that's kind of my job, uh, my day job. But we do need to ensure that AI is safe if it happens. But the speed of development of AI and the potential power of AI are very uncertain um, so we can't rely on it if you if we can't plan on it we should prepare for it but we can't plan on it right. so yes if we have the friendly ai then everything of this type becomes much easier mm. because now every single flying f factory flying through space would have a super intelligent ai running it um, coordinating with each other and you get uh, extreme amounts of, um, dis of a, uh, spread out, uh, spread out power, um, spread out, uh, basically, distributed. Uh, there's another word, distributed. You get a lot of distributed manufacturing happening very fast. So that's the AI route. Now, not AI, but just automation, better automation. It's doable, I think. It is very doable because these processes, especially if you start with asteroids rather than planets, are re relatively repetitive. Well, it's you take the material, you shoot it up to your factory, your factory manufactures, sends this to orbit, energy is bounced back. Um, so it seems like 
And if every sort of factory or drone or thing that you built has some level of automation, or even maybe is run by some skilled technician on earth, um, I'm sure we could get a million sufficiently skilled technicians, each could run a factory in space. They could mm. sit on earth coordinating everything. Um, and, or as I say, more likely we can automate it, but we already have in a sense, the people and the skills to do it. So yes, and if the entire human race for some odd reason wanted to Dyson the sun right now as a priority project, I think this could probably be done in 30 or 40 years. Mm. Um, I don't expect it will be done because there's no particularly strong reason to do it. And there's a lot of strong reasons not to do it, at least in terms of geopolitics. Mm. One country wouldn't want another country doing all this. So, um, but yeah, so it's, it seems to be more, putting AI aside, it seems to be more of a coordination of humans problem than a technological barrier. Mm -hmm. So the human race will Dyson the sun when the human race is ready to Dyson the sun. When they're coordinated um, enough. <laughs> and in a sense, we already can, most likely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, true. Indeed. Right. Um, and the strategy uh, of uh, once we've actually achieved pulling apart some matter and, and um, building a large mega scale structure, uh, then we'd be able to use that structure to propel um, von Neumann probes of various types um, to nearby galaxies and far away galaxies with hardly any hop hopping points at all. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the energy requirements, well, for that's the title of the paper was six hours. Um, uh, uh, so it's six hours of the sun's energy is required with uh, assuming a third efficiency, a maximum efficiency, you'd only need two hours of the sun's energy to propel probes to every single galaxy that we could ever reach in the entire universe. Hmm. Now, I'm making certain assumptions about us being able to decelerate these probes on arrival. Um, I calculated this using the assumption that we had matter-antimatter uh, reactors to decelerate. But in a sense, it doesn't... It's a, well, it's, it is a very, uh, in a sense, despite assuming we have that super technology, it is a very conservative assumption because there are more interesting ways of decelerating when you reach galaxies that don't involve just carrying the mass with you in order to decelerate. Like there's um, the buzzard ramjet. Uh, the basic idea is you just basically suck in hydrogen from the, well, the, darkness between the stars and you uh, you uh, fuse it and you use that as your engine. Now, it's originally planned this could use, you could accelerate with it, but the problem was that the faster you got, the more energy you lost when you sucked in the hydrogen. But for decelerating, that's a plus. And I've also found certain things that, uh, the, basically the rocket equation does not need to apply um, in deceleration. And if we can avoid the rocket equation, we can get extremely efficient deceleration. Um, so something like if you deploy a large solar sail and eject a huge bunch of lasers ahead of you and all the lasers then paint your sail um, then and using this to decelerate, there are ways of using methods like this to get around the rocket equation. And the rocket equation is basically exponential because um, you need to, in the rocket equation, you need the fuel to move the f fuel to move the fuel to move the fuel to move the fuel to move the fuel that moves you. So if you can avoid that, you can get a lot less, you need a lot less energy. And it seems that it can be avoided. Hmm, indeed. So, wow. How many galaxies do you think we could reach um, within, like, let's just say we uh, achieved a, like, incredibly powerful Dyson Swarm 
um, or an equivalent to it within our solar system. Do you have any estimate on how many galaxies uh, or superclusters we could reach? This is not just uh, galaxies in our own superclusters. This is the galaxies in other superclusters. Is that correct? I should have pre yes. the question. So I'm um, just looking at my own paper because we calculated <laughs> this. Yes. Uh, but I didn't. Uh, I omitted to remember it. Um, so these, no it, yeah, these numbers are really. I mean, like we should mention at this point that some of the numbers that that have mentioned in your paper are just so mind-bogglingly huge that it's hard to intuit what they are. Right? It's hard to really get your head around these large, incredibly large numbers. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's why. Well, that's why you play with the numbers rather than the uh, the concept, because the concepts would just boggle you mm -hmm. uh, or boggle me completely. Oh, they boggle um, me. <laughs> so, how how many galaxies we can reach depends on how fast mm. we move. Um, basically, because the universe expansion seems to be accelerating, there seems to be a limit in what we call co-moving coordinates. So basically the distances as they stand now, there are some galaxies that we will never reach, that we can still see, but that we can never reach. Um, interestingly, because of the weird way the universe expands, there are some galaxies that are receding from us faster than light that we can reach. Mm. Um, that, uh, that, that's just because we're in a sort of unstable phase of the expansion. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in any case, um, so if we go at 50% of the speed of light, uh, we're talking about um, in the 100 million galaxies, very roughly. Um, if we go to 80% of the speed of light, we're just under a billion. And if we go to 99% of the speed of light, then we're talking about the 4 billion galaxies. So quite a lot. And I did a calculation about how many, basically, if we start now, if we start uh, next year, if we start in a century, we basically lose a galaxy a year uh, by delaying. So you, you could either say, this is huge, every year we lose an entire galaxy. Or you could say, this is minute, every year we, le uh, we, use, we lose one billionth of what we could reach. Oh, it's so sad to just let go of a galaxy every year. So <laughs> given that, do you think we should speed up development? Um, possibly, but the... the um, the really key thing that, uh, from the calculations is that it's much more important to go fast than to start early. Right, yes. Um, so there's no hurry to launch, but developing the technologies to go faster or the f as fast as possible. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, if we, if we really go to absurd speeds, and here we're talking beyond what our sun can reasonably supply, if we go to 99.9%, .9 Mm. The speed of light or things like that, then we get a whole other um, ream of galaxies that we can reach. Yes, indeed. Um, and at this stage, we'll talk about game theory, why we should do so later. But at this stage, <laughs> we should recognize that um, we've got black holes in the middle of our uh, galaxy, or at least one big one, supermassive black mm -hmm. holes. And it's possible to create some sort of Dyson swarm around that using the energy, um, according to Anders Sandberg. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he believes that that's possible um, and that would probably allow for a lot more power uh, and a lot more force to to um, propel these uh, von Neumann probes out there. Is, would you agree? Yeah, but that's not a um, not a particularly rapid or efficient way to do it. I mean, the oh. center of our galaxy is... How many, is it millions or hundreds of thousands of light years away? Yeah. Um, so the, the energy of our sun is enough to launch, uh, I calculated 40 probes towards every single galaxy we could reach at 99% of the speed of light. If we want more probes, we, 
wait, we wait a bit longer around our sun, or if we're feeling greedy, we expand in our local group and we get, say, 100 local stars if we sort of really need. This is going to give us the required amount of energy a lot faster than going for the uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy. Of course, mm. the ones we sent out, they might decide to target the center of the oncoming galaxy as the source for their energy, because then they can expand and take over that galaxy themselves. Mm. Um, but the the main point of this paper is that a Kardashev Type Two civilization, uh, one that can master its solar system, has way more than enough energy necessary to become a Type Four civilization, one that controls most of the reachable universe. Um, so the the energy budget, the material budget is very, very low for transitioning from K2 to K4. That was the surprising thing um, uh, when I crunched the numbers on that. Yes, indeed. Wow. So, all right. So well, let, let's talk about game theory then. Why would it be useful um, for a civilization like ours, even if we're u- u- uber ethical, to um, take up as much as the cosmic commons as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, well, can I start with the less ethical reasons first? Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it's um, if, if humanity is not a whole or not coordinated as one sort of entity, there might be a small group that might want to escape from the larger groups, uh, from oppression or for whatever reasons. This has happened often in history. And some small groups can shoot out into the universe. If, if, you just, if, you, if, you're, if you're aiming to escape rather than expand, then you can reach absurd speeds. And that these absurd speeds are so fast that given, say, a few years delay, you can never be caught the universe expansion itself will prevent you from ever being caught. So, and if you have some central power that wants to prevent all these others from expanding, well, the easiest way they can do it is to expand first themselves. If you can never catch anyone, much better to be there first. So that's why there might be internal dynamics that'll uh, cause uh, expansion. Um, and But to get back to the game theory and the ethical thing there, uh, people have often said that when we reach this level or aliens that reach this level would be enlightened and wouldn't seek to expand and control and things of that nature, which is true. But even if we're enlightened, it is in our interests in, almost, in every circumstance to grab the unit as much of the universe as we can not necessarily to exploit its resources but if there is an unethical civilization that was expanding we wouldn't want to leave the resources to them if there isn't well then we just we're fine we we plant a little flag or a little drone there to keep an eye on things and or we or we behave ethically towards any alien civilization we encounter it, it's basically um, I sort of bring up the sometimes the analogy of would you, if you're sat at a table, there's a red button in the middle. Uh, if you press the red button, you become ruler of the world, or whoever presses it becomes ruler of the world. Do you press it? And most people say no. And then I say, Hitler is also sitting at the same table. Do you press it? It's the same kind of dynamic. Um, we would be fine not taking the galaxy if we knew that everybody else would not take the galaxy and they would be fine with that. But the the risk of defection is such that it's always in our advantage to take the galaxy first and uh, the universe. And if we meet each other, that doesn't mean there's necessarily going to be any wars or if we're both enlightened or we reach some sort of negotiated agreement that doesn't have to be wars or conflicts necessarily, but it would be it would be an abdication of responsibility not to expand um, if we thought that there was a risk 
of an aggressive civilization expanding. Yes, totally agree there. I mean, there's just so much resources that could be co-opted for for um, an evil civilization. It'd be such a shame if the universe was totally turned into evil matter or <laughs> sort of <laughs> turned to a big like ball of suffering or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, there is no realistic way in which a civilization based around one star system can resist one that is based around the entire galaxy or even just the nearby stars. Because if, if it comes to it, they can start chucking stars at us. Hmm. It'll be slow, but if we have sort of 10 stars bearing down on us in a collision course, there's not really all that much that we'll be able to do at that point. But this is the kind of resources that would be trivial for a galaxy-spanning civilization to bring to bear. Right. Do you think an alien civilization has thrown Andromeda at us and, and it's just taking <laughs> its time to get us? <laughs> no, I don't. No. <laughs> Okay. Because well, they, they know that Andromeda is mainly hollow, so they that's that was true. a terrible thing to check. <laughs> I, I know, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, look, now, look, uh, yeah, so if we achieve some sort of um, utilitronium explosion or some sort of happiness explosion, um, some sort of, yeah, uh, would, would, um, what if we left some important aspect of, uh, ethics out of the equation, um, what would we do if we wanted to update uh, the explosion's core beliefs or the, the, the goal or the utility function of an explosion? We wouldn't have much chance then, wouldn't we, once we trigger one off? Um, it sort of depends. I mean, first of all, if we leave out... People talk about happiness. I prefer to sort of use terms like flourishing. Yeah, me too. Or mm. to, to give the impression, it's not just your sort of, ah, oh, we're happy, but you have a meaningful life. Mm. You have uh, uh, great experiences and that challenge you. And uh, anyway, so it's uh, an all, altogether uh, positive, uh, uh, very positive experience. But yes, if we leave out certain key elements of that, that's yeah. disastrous. That's part of the reason that I'm looking at AI um, safety and how we can get all of human values uh, into AI so that we don't leave out anything critical. But in terms of the expansion in the universe, um, it's not so much a question of getting the right values, but of maintaining control. So hmm. you can send out probes to colonize uh, uh, entire galaxies and the colonize just basically means you just put one one probe in every star system or one probe around every planet because it's very easy to manufacture a huge army if you need to um, you, there's no need to manufacture the army uh, initially but as soon as you see any trace of anyone there then you can very speedily manufacture the army just in the same way that we can very speedily launch probes um, but the main thing would be to have control so that um, we, could, we could email patches, if you want. So uh, we send out another probe with, this is the, what we want you to do, or this is uh, the new updated human values. Now, the most distant galaxies were not going to be able to do that because they'll have drifted beyond our grasp for a second launch. Um, but, well, I say that a bit fast. I mean, these things are going to be in motion for billions of years. Um, so if we take a hundred years or a thousand years to figure out the correct values, that's an insignificant portion of the trajectory. And oh yeah, think, thinking aloud here, mm -hmm. all that we would need is to send out these probes so that they can receive, they set up some sort of signaling thing to receive our signals. And then we can signal to them in various ways, maybe using relays. We send it to a near, we send it to a galaxy that we can reach that's not too far from then. And they send out some signal, maybe by turning the stars on and off in the galaxy in a certain direction uh, by shielding them with the swarm and then unshielding them, uh, that you can use this to send messages at light speed. And so at light speed, we would be able to catch up with our first generation of probes. 
Right, yes, indeed. Would value drift be a problem? I mean, like, if, if, if it is a problem, there could be a chance of conflict as well. Um, this is, if you've probably maybe seen the TV show The Expanse, uh, the Mars civilization, um, who've broken off and have new values or different values from the Earth civilization. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting uh, to think about value drift and what, what possible wars could ensue. I'm thinking that value drift will first it's going to slow down quite a lot soon mm. as soon as we start being able to basically understand and control our own values mm. uh, because we all have an innate mild tendency to resist our own value drift and you could, when we can formalize that so that's going to happen a lot more uh, and the key thing is not so much even to prevent value drift but to ensure coordination. It's if two probes or two groups of probes or uh, superhumans and modified Martian humans or whatever with different values, the important thing is not that they agree, but that they can reach a settlement. Hmm. So if there's some automated way of reaching a settlement, then of sh uh, sort of combining the utilities or averaging them uh, mm, then mm, mm. value drift need not result in war at all. Some form um, of algocracy. Of what, sorry? Algocracy. Oh, sort of, sort of like a, um, I guess, a management through algorithm. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, and if we don't have value drift, we might still end up with wars because people, countries with very similar values have been at war before, um, uh, for for self-interested purposes, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's more about solving the what do we, what's the deal that we reach and that we can immediately enforce on our sides, rather than um, preventing the value drifts or getting the values correct or uh, or that kind of stuff. Do you think uh, if, like a lot of people are con um, concerned that? we won't be able to, uh, I guess, meaningfully describe our values ever, that they'll always mm -hmm. be somewhat um, intangible and that they won't, like there's, there maybe to some degree, they'll be, um, I guess, empirically uh, verifiable uh, and internally consistent, but um, they could be different from one, one uh, culture to another or one group to another. Well, I have some good news for people on that issue. Great. Um, if we can't do that, we'll probably all end up dead. Um, <laughs> so there's no reason to worry about expanding in the universe. Okay, that, that is a bit facetious. But the main thing is that as we get more and more power, either through AI, but that's the most obvious route, but just generally more power over ourselves, over the environment, um, things are going to have to become more and more explicit uh, or else they're just going to go. Uh, there's the old law, uh, the old law of, um, what is it, that um, if something is not measured, it's not valued. So we've, uh, we're losing a lot of things in the ecosystem in part because we can't really measure what we're losing. And as our power increases, this is going to become more and more important that we measure everything that we value so that we don't destroy it with our extreme power, our technologies, our algorithms. So yes, I don't, I, do, I don't buy the argument that we cannot capture uh, all of our values um, in, uh, in a sufficiently clear form including changes in values. Hmm. So, um, so our human values. Better values. That al yeah, so allow, allow some moral progress, but not allow moral drift. Now, if we go, I don't want to talk about that because it's going to be hours and hours <laughs> okay. of that, but there are, some, there are some possibilities in that space. Hmm. Yes. Well, so it's just because 
Uh, so it's just because we formalize things doesn't mean that they're now unchangeable. Yeah, I've often wondered, like, um, why are we latching on to human value when we know that humans are biased and, and uh, we, we, we can imagine that since we've already seen value progress over the, over the many millennia that humanity has had civilization in writing form, we'd probably assume that future humans would um, want, w would have different values or more uh, progressive values. Well, there's also been moral regression in yep. many places and in many epochs um and there's there's sort of the aspect you, you touched on different cultures with different values and different people with different values and there's the sort of moral progress of say increased individual liberty In, individual values are given more weight and allowed uh, to have more expression hmm. um and that, in that sense, uh, I expect values to continue improving because we'll have more capabilities, more coordination and that kind of thing. But there are also things that are just basically because we feel we feel values have improved because the values of the present are our own. Uh, to, for example, there's co strong concepts of honor in um, more traditional cultures. Now, this is a very violent thing in practice generally, but even mm. sort of say Victorians had a concept of honor and this is mainly gone by the wayside nowadays because the role that it fulfilled in society is no longer needed. Um, it was basically a place where the, when you had sort of poor law enforcement and more clans um, smaller states, more instability, um, things like honor uh, and reputation counted for a lot more than nowadays. If nowadays we do, we sign co the miracle of modern civilization is we sign contracts with people that we have no idea uh, about, or that we've maybe done a cursory Google search about, and we sign them, and we expect that it'll be fine, and it generally is. Hmm. Whereas before we had to, people had their reputation, their honor, their word, and we had to seek out the ones of high honor and stuff like that. Anyway, the point is, it was a useful value, instrumentally useful. It's no longer instrumentally useful and it's vanished. And if you took someone from that culture and then gave them all the resources of today, gave them all the knowledge and stuff like that, they would probably say that we have morally degenerated uh, because we have lost this important value of honor. Now, we might tell them, well, this was a by, this was an instrumentally useful thing. They say, yes, but this is what I value. It wasn't, I did not value this for instrumental reasons. I valued this. These were my values. Uh, and then they vanished. And therefore, this is a moral degradation. And you can do that with lots of other different values. Um, so yeah, there's some things that are clearly improved uh, and some things that are clearly got closer to us so that we feel that they're improved. Uh, but it's not necessarily... We shouldn't necessarily expect that um, our descendants will have more knowledge but uh, we can't necessarily say that they will have moral improvement. It might just be, as I say, value drift or value change. Mm, indeed. Well, I, I get a feeling from this discussion that it's, it's, I've got a, a lot more hope in there being an ethical empire <laughs> in the future. Um, do you feel the same way? Do you think that there's, if, if we do achieve a Kardashev type two civilization uh, that can develop Dyson swarms and, and stuff and start seeding the observable universe with um, probes and colonizing it, I, do you have, um, is your likelihood strong that we'll do it in an ethical way? Um. Yes. Do you have high to the I've... question that you as you exact to the exact question you have said yes, mm -hmm. um, but for a sort of 
uh, maybe not for the a reason you might expect. Okay. And it, it's all it's all to do with AI. Hmm. Now we don't know when we might get AI. We don't know how powerful it might be. Hmm. But the most plausible scenario in which we expand anytime soon, say let's say in the hundred next hundred years, is because we have discovered true AI. Uh, and that it's powerful. And if we've done that and survived, then I take this as, as a sign that we have almost certainly managed to inject our ethical values into the AI. And at that point, uh, well, in some as in some ways, we've won. Uh, we've won the game, and now we just um, can start the party uh, because we've now got an ethical. An ethical, an ethical super being, in a sense, it doesn't need to be just one being, but if a coordinated networks is just as fine. But we have great power in an ethical direction, and then everything's everything's good. I mean, not not all problems are going to be solved, but the main problem of human survival and human flourishing and the risk of disasters will have been put aside. Now, if we don't have AI uh, or just have, say, advanced automation, then it gets a lot more complicated because we don't get the, now the powerful beings are ethical for free. So then there might be different factions expanding in different circumstances. Uh, there might be the risk of war. There might be others rushing away. Um, and if we're expanding with actual humans rather than with uh, von Neumann probes, then everything is a lot slower. So we're probably talking about 500 years, those kind of time scales, uh, or maybe maybe less, maybe more. But without AI, uh, I would say at least 100 years, probably more, uh, probably quite a bit more before we get this kind of expansion. And then I don't know the circumstances under which it might happen, how coordinated and how disparate uh, humanity will be at that point. Right, yes. I guess but the, the concept of how much um, galaxies we could inhabit with a civilization uh, if we did get AI right brings to bear how much there is to waste you, this sort of astronomical waste concept where if we don't get AI right, uh, then the um, it's extremely improbable other than, you know, if there's other, if there's no other civilizations out there to do it, it's extremely improbable that the, uh, the, the observable universe will be populated by flourishing life worth living. And that's mm -hmm. yeah, the, 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 the numbers thinking about the numbers of slots of flourishing life that could just, totally not be available in the future if we get AI wrong is mind-bogglingly huge. Mm -hmm. Especially if you can consider that the real energy in the universe is not the glowing light of the stars, but is the mass. The Hiroshima uh, bomb um, transformed one gram of matter into energy. So that's basically the upper bound on the energy that we have available. So yes, if we could transfer matter directly into energy, then the Earth itself would keep human civilization as we know it going for trillions and trillions of years, let alone if we grab a significant portion of the universe. So the, the amount of energy available is absurd. And also the efficiency with which we could run our brains um, is also, it's, it's, not, it's not on the same scale, but we could probably run our brains about a billion times more efficiently using a billion times less energy, especially if we wait until the universe is cold. Um, so there is... Uh, uh, the estivation yeah. hypothesis, yes. Yes, I, I was a co-author on that. And I'll tell you a dirty secret. Um, <laughs> it, it wasn't really about the Fermi paradox very much. Because 
it, it, the same sort of argument of why not grab the universe applies. Okay, you're going to sleep. Why not grab the universe while you're sleeping? Because you can just send a few probes to do it. It would be foolish not to. Um, but the basic, but the real reason for that, or the entertaining reason, was what could humans potentially do if we had huge amounts of resources and huge amounts of time? Uh, and then, basically, the idea is go to sleep, grab the universe, uh, wait ten trillion years, and then party. But yeah, it, it's basically it's an upper bound on the sort of energy that we could get um, according to current laws of physics uh, without going beyond them. Yeah, indeed. That's so fascinating. There's an idea that Lee Smolin came up with, and that is that we could co-opt black holes, or um, that black holes would seed new universes, and, and other people, including myself, sort of speculate that we might be able to um, engineer uh, uh, universes to be right for the right kinds of computation to achieve flourishing life. But I don't know of any real empirical justification for this, but I just wanted, was wondering quickly what your thoughts were. Um, well, I have to warn you that in terms of black holes, I have a uh, idiosyncratic view of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually an old fashioned view of them. Uh, basically, uh, for various reasons, I mean, it comes up on stack ex physics stack exchange periodically, uh, an idea that won't die, and I think it won't die because I think it's right, but a lot most physicists think it's wrong, so go with them for the moment. But it's just that black holes never actually fully form, that there is never an event horizon formed. It's hovering on the edge of being formed. Hmm. And so hence black holes are not as, well, getting close to a black hole is incredibly weird, but the black hole, the interior, is not as weird as people think because the interior doesn't exist in a sense or never happens. But that's a sort of idiosyncratic view um, of mine. But if we, but, I feel a lot of this, we could use black holes to make other universes, is because, well, black holes are weird and mysterious. Um, and we don't have a, a theory that fully explains them. So why not say that they go to other universes or something like that? <laughs> um, I'm, think, I'm thinking that there's probably a lot more potential um, in software, in a sense running virtual uh, universes rather than physical universes because there'd be a lot less um uh, a lot less uh, requirements for those hmm. uh, but of course if we if we manage to connect with other universes um and communicate meaningfully with them that basically means essentially that we can enter them we can send them uh, ourselves in a digital version uh, if anything else. So this then becomes, well, basically, we can reach other universes somehow. and mm -hmm. Or we can make other universes. It's, um, uh, but n none of this is really, well, none of this is plausible uh, in according to physics as we know it now. But we know yeah. that there is a missing physics. So it's possible that if we got a theory of quantum gravity, everything... Uh, suddenly we'd manage to open super string holes to sparticles and other universes or whatever. Uh, so I'm not completely ruling it out, but in a sense, the amount of resources available in our universe is so close to infinity that um, it's not really worth thinking about these exotic scenarios too much. Hmm. And I know it's finite and people would object to saying that a finite number is close to infinity. But from our human perspective, it's so huge that it basically is infinity. If we were told that we could expand infinitely in the universe, I don't think that that would blow our minds anymore. I think it might blow our minds less uh, than actually just dealing with the sheer scale of the finite amount that we can reach. Hmm. I have a sort of saying that um, 
some large numbers are bigger than infinity. <laughs> mm -hmm. In that in our brain, infinity is sort of, yeah, it's infinitely big, but it's kind of not that big because we don't really grasp it. But absolutely huge numbers that have to be explained for half an hour before you grasp how big they are, that feels huge in a way that, oh, and then infinity doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. <laughs> I guess, like, because there's no other galactic civilizations that we can detect, and given the Drake equation, how um, what kinds of likelihoods we should expect civilizations to appear, um, given the hospitability of life around the universe, given there have been lots of Goldilocks zones that have been around long before we have came about, as, um, you know, on Earth here. Mm -hmm. It's just like uh, this is just one explanation, one, um, this whole idea of escaping to another universe is just a strong attractor for the reason why other civilizations have not around to be seen anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, what is your view on the Fermi paradox and the reasons for it? Well, I don't think that ex escaping to another universe is a particularly good explanation for the same reason that I keep on going on. Why not grab this universe as well? Hmm. You, you can do it with automated probes. There's no disadvantage to doing it. Um, it may give you extra security, so why not do it? And as I say, you don't have to do it in a vicious or cruel way, just as a as a precaution. So, um, so it's. But I think that unfortunately, the the most likely explanation for the Fermi paradox is just basically that there are no um, technological civilizations anywhere within the reachable universe. And the way to reconcile that with the Drake equation is to remember that for the Drake equations, each of the terms, you're taking the mean or median, depending on it, probability of the term, and then you multiply these all together. But some of these things are actually very narrow. Uh, we've got a very good estimate of the number of planets. Well, not maybe very good, but we've got a decent estimate number of strong attractive for this gives us an okay estimate of the Goldilocks zone. So it's not narrow, 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 but it's a reasonably reasonable curve. But there are other things like what is the probability of uh, self-reproducing life starting uh, what is the probability of central nervous systems getting developed? Um, these numbers, we have an estimate, but it's actually extremely wide if you look at it. The probability could be very high or very low. We just really don't have an idea. And when you add that, if you add, if you want, if you add the variance of each estimate, then the there are no alien civilizations in the reachable universe becomes a not too improbable uh, option. You just need some of the ones with wide variance to be a few orders of magnitude lower than the mean estimate, which is not too improbable. And then the whole thing gives you no aliens around here. Hmm. Okay, well, that's hopeful. <laughs> oh, okay. I was... Well, it depends. I mean... It means that aliens won't eradicate us if they were had any desire to do that. It also means that kind of life in this sector, the flourishing of life is on our shoulders. Well, that's right. But um, it, like, I guess, it, I guess it also means that um, the great filter is more likely behind us than ahead of us. Or the, mm -hmm. the, a large portion of the great filter is probably behind us. Yes. And if I had to guess I would place it very early in the formation of life. Hmm. I don't think it's in the Earth-like planets are not rare. I don't think that's a major part of the Great Filter. And there are various reasons why um, I, I do not, between a, a basic central nervous system and a dolphin level of intelligence, there are various reasons to suspect there's no Great Filter there. Um, things like convergent evolution. Hmm. We, for example, we can't use the fact that 
apes are smart. This tells us nothing because apes are on our direct line. So we're smart. Our relatives mm. are smart. This is not a surprise. But dolphins are smart, and dolphins are quite distant from us. Hmm. And octopuses are smart. And yeah, octopuses are very, very distant from <laughs> us. Yeah. Um, and this sort of convergent evolution tells us that intelligent life developing from our latest common ancestor with the uh, octopus, which is very, very far behind, is, pro is, does not seem to be of too low probability. So that's mm. not a place to put the great filter. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's most likely from what single to multiple celled life or something like that? Possibly, maybe life itself, the reproduction. Mitochondria is very, very strange how that happened. Um, oxygen. This is another very odd thing. If you think about it. oxygen is a waste product. Uh, that's how it came and that's where it filled up the, the whole atmosphere uh, but it's a waste product that you can extract smart. energy from hmm. this is very unusual if you sort of think of waste products are normally ones they don't have energy that's the point they've used up their energy but this waste product turned out to be very useful for powering plants and animals especially on land so we end this this is something that seems a bit odd to me um, unusual that a waste product would be so energy rich uh, in practice. Um, and so that's another candidate for... So basically I'm looking at things that only happened basically once or that th there's no convergent evolution uh, and that seem very unusual if we didn't know that they happened. And mitochondria seem very unusual. Um, the oxygen uh, see, it seems very unusual, and there are a few other things, but I don't really have any strong uh, intuition as to where mm. where it might lie. Yeah. Say, say um, like it say, say the xenobiologists found uh, uh, like a completely separate tree, phylogenetic tree. Even on Earth, there could be like sort of uh, bacteria or something like that with um, you know completely different origins uh, or they found on an asteroid or they found in the valleys of mars um mm -hmm. you know a completely separate second tree um, mm -hmm. how would that update your estimates well that would that would push the the great filter before and after the tree that we find mm -hmm. um wait uh before or no, it would push it after the tree we found, mm. uh, unless there was a common origin. Because uh, yeah. it, it is possible that life on Mars, if discovered, came from yeah. Earth. Yeah. You rain down lots of asteroids on Earth, things go flying, um, most of them die, but there are a lot of things that can survive. Long journeys in space fall on Mars. and So if it would have to be clearly on a different tree hmm. um, and it is sort of if you think about life on earth there are things that are very different from us um, not just extremophiles but sort of yeah completely odd chemistries and things like that but they all tend to be quite simple and we don't How see would that... evidence of life on mars um, where, yeah, we don't see evidence of life on Mars or easy evidence of life on Mars. This suggests, but doesn't prove, that it's the very early that is the most difficult. Because if we get very different lives here, but not any life on a nearby planet that is different, and there are various things that work and don't work, but it's not... It's not complete. It's not completely inhospitable to life as all the other planets are. It suggests that getting it started was tricky, and then it's spread out. But anyway, this is speculation, and I have not crunched any numbers on this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. True. 
Is there, uh, what's been amazing, uh, this is mind-blowing stuff, is there any points that we haven't covered that you think is worth bringing up at this point? Um, yes. If we do encounter an alien civilization soon, then basically what happens to us is whatever the alien civilization decides. There's no chance of sort of human resistance or stuff like that. They could just drop asteroids on us um, until uh, there's no humans left. Um, if, if they wanted to do that. I mean, this is the sort of power that you have when you can travel between the stars it and started with take apart planets and asteroids. Um, but if humanity expands as a mature civilization and encounters another mature civilization with potential for conflict, what's going to be very... <laughs> There's sort of two key issues. The first, is there a principled way of resolving disagreements? Hmm. Is there a single bargaining equilibrium, if you want? We haven't... There's... There's the Nash bargaining equilibrium. There's a few other things there, but none of them sort of really seem universal. Uh, but maybe there is. And if there is, or if there's ways that you can sort of... Because the problem is the front lines of these expansions are completely disconnected from the center. Um, they're expanding at almost light speed. There is no time to send a message back home. So the front line of the probes have to be able to negotiate on behalf of the entire human race, essentially a division that both sides will stick to. Hmm. Uh, another key, and then you, you go about the offense and defense. What is the strongest? And it's, it's not clear. Um, as I said, if we were in a solar system, they could chuck stars into, into us until we're... Uh, that suggests that sort of offense is stronger. But what if we sort of took apart the entire solar system and the whole infrastructure was all floating through space? And like a giant foglet cloud, right? Yeah, and uh, when a star goes through it, it, takes a, uh, it burns about a millionth of the thing out. So maybe there, this is defensively very powerful. And mm. we just don't know. But there is a last thing, which is the scorched earth tactic. Hmm. Even if offense is stronger, if you can ruin your resources, make them unavailable, then um, you can use this as a threat uh, that, makes, that makes attacking rather foolish. Hmm. Right, so so there's, there'd be no incentive for an alien civilization to take over your space if you said, hey, we're just going to blow ourselves up and burn our local yep. commons to the ground before you can use it. And if they still attack, well, then they were going to destroy us anyway. So, um, But they won't <laughs> attack us for the resources. And mm. as I said, there are ways of escaping yep. in speeds that can never be caught. So... While humanity is expanding, say, in a sphere, uh, it might be wise to send out some escape groups in, say, 20 different directions. Um, and if mm. so, if we're if we're unlucky enough to reach an aggressive civilization, hopefully one of the 20s will be going mm. in the opposite direction to that and will then never be caught. Yeah. So that there's a, an escape possibility given the fact that we can actually beam or like send the information of the local part of the civilization, which is under threat at the speed of light to these mm -hmm. escaping um, yeah. portions of the civilization. And light can never be caught. Oh, yeah. I I'd like to, to do a last thing, uh, yep. the last point that just yep. occurred to me. Yep. So this expansion is almost at light speed. So you might initially think, well, the aliens might arrive tomorrow and we'll never see them coming because... Of it. But this is almost light speed over four gigaparsecs or these kind of distances. Even at 99.9% .9 
of light speed, there will be thousands of years before between the light arriving from the civilization and the actual front wave. Um, so we would most likely see them first. Uh -huh. And the other thing is that it is incredibly unlikely that we are in a very thin slice of time right now where the aliens are not here yet, but they will be soon. <laughs> that would be a tiny portion of the time of expansion. Um, so I don't expect to see aliens arriving anytime soon, unless for some reason they're already here. Um, uh, as in, if I was expanding, I might have sort of dropped a probe in some asteroid somewhere to keep an eye on humanity. Um, this is science fiction, it's, but I think that's, it's much more likely that science fiction than we happen, we stumble upon the period where an alien civilization just arrives at us. Hmm. They're either, either their boundary is beyond us or it's way, uh, it's a, it's very far away from us in, in, in either direction. We've either been swallowed up in their empire without realizing it a long time ago, or there's still some uh, distance away is the most likely. Hmm. Just on mm -hmm. time scale considerations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Wow. So, look, I, I think these are really important topics. Now, I know that Future of Humanity Institute are doing wonderful things. So, if anybody out there wants to donate some money, throw them uh, <laughs> your way, right? Um, so, yeah. But the question becomes like, what can people do if they want to actively increase the likelihood of. Um, capturing the cosmic co commons for ethical means, what can people do today? Well, first of all, solve global politics. The, mm. That's always an easy yeah, first sure. step. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is the possibility of safe ethical AI, which I'm working on. Um, we, even if AI is very uncertain when it arrives, this might still give you more leverage than solving global politics. Mm. Um, which seems a lot harder. So I'm working on ways that sort of AIs can figure out human values, um, despite the fact that human values are contradictory, um, changeable, manipulable, and underdefined. And I, I do it in that order because the fact that human values are contradictory is not too much of a problem, actually. The fact they're changeable is a bit more of a problem Manipulable, a bit more of a problem, but underdefined is a huge problem. Uh, that's of the real challenge of uh, figuring out human values for uh, the long term. Indeed, yeah. I hope that we can develop AI that does, it's not just necessarily intelligent, but AI that can understand stuff, not just powerful, but an AI that can understand what you know, what concepts are rather than just make great predictions about what that, what, how things will go in the future. Yeah. So apparently Under, a lot of AI, sorry. Understanding isn't enough, unfortunately. Uh, a lot, we need it to be aligned in our values. Uh, there are various scenarios in which you have AIs that perfectly understand everything there is to know about humans, hmm. but don't care. Or even oh. in some cases, don't, <laughs> okay, th this is getting away from the subject in a sense, but in a sense, you can look at humans and conclude that they are completely rational and not be wrong. They would It's not right, but it's not wrong either. Hmm. If you model humans as completely rational, then our values get extremely complicated. But this model will never it'll never reach an observation that contradicts it. Hmm. You, you, you might, someone might say, well, that human was clearly irrational. Why did they drink and go driving uh, the night before their exam? Well, obviously they valued failing that exam in a spectacular fashion or something like that. There's always, you could always fit an explanation, but that that's a bit esoteric, but, there's a challenge there, and we are making progress on it. Fantastic. I've... 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, well yeah, okay. So um, what, what, if somebody wants to find out what you're doing in that space, um, what papers can they look at? Um, well, I post a lot of things on Less Wrong, uh, lesswrong.com. I, um, um, it's, I post a lot of things. Um, so what would be best to look at is on there, uh, an, uh, my ultra simplified research agenda. That is a short thing of how AIs can extract human values and it links to longer posts and to a video about it. Mm -hmm. And also our NeurIPS paper, Occam's razor is insufficient to infer the preferences of irrational agents. That's the one that shows that you can't, you cannot deduce the values of humans just by looking at us, no matter how smart you are. You need to make certain assumptions, hopefully not too many, but you need to make some assumptions that cannot come just from observation in order to infer what human values are. Um, but even by, uh, even if you're, even if you're super smart and you know everything there is to know about humans, you will not get human values unless you make certain key assumptions. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm sure we could talk for hours about that, but um, given that it's it, after the 11... Paper, the paper's on the archive, by the way. Oh, cool. All right. So Fantastic. it can be found there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I'll link to that. Well, it's been wonderful uh, talking about this sort of stuff and, and to talk to you again as well. So I do emphasize uh, everybody here, if you, you enjoy this sort of topic and um, you feel as though you'd like to contribute, then please donate to the Future of Humanity Institute or plan your career in such a way that you'll be able to directly affect these, these issues. Um, so, yeah, it's been great. Or, and also check out the Effective Altruists who are sort oh, yes, of in our indeed. outer orbit. Um, if you want to look at another avenue for doing good. Mm, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So I've interviewed a number of effective altruists, so I think they're doing wonderful things. Yeah, so it's been great. Uh, thanks heaps for chatting again, and um, yeah, okay. hopefully see you again down the tracks. See you again, mate. <laughs> the archive.